Good evening. It's my pleasure to call the Thursday, May 19th, 2022 regular board meeting of the School District of Haverford Township to order. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> the mission of the school district of Haverford Township is to educate and to inspire a community of lifelong learners who become well-rounded global citizens. The pillars of our educational system are <clears throat> our school environment is safe and nurturing. Excellence in education is a shared responsibility in partnership with all district and community members. Whole child development is vital to our educational system. Supports and conditions exist whereby all students have opportunities to grow and excel in the areas of academic, technical and career and social emotional learning. And our decision making process is student centered and student voice is valued. The 2020 through 2025 district goals Number one, social, social and emotional wellness to produce a community of empathetic and resilient learners with skills to socially and emotionally flourish. Number two, to prepare contemporary citizens, modernize and expand learning experiences to prepare students as critical thinkers, problem solvers, innovators, and designers within a complex global society. And number three, diversity and inclusion to establish a culturally diverse and inclusive educational experience that develops socio-cultural proficiency. Thank you. And now the roll call. Dr. Crispin. Here. Dr. King. Here. Dr. Larson. Here. Dr. McKay. Mr. Schwartz. Here. Ms. Snodgrass. Here. Ms. Vitale. Here. Mr. Feinberg. Here. Ms. Wiedemann. Here. Ms. Um, or Dr. McKay is traveling today. The next item on the agenda is the official minutes. I will accept a motion to approve the official minutes from the May 5th, 2022 regular public board meeting. Crispin move. Vitaly second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The minutes are approved. And now we get to our favorite part of the agenda, all the student reports. Dr. Rushi, would you like to Mrs. start? McGilvery, yes. Oh, Mrs. Yep. McGilvery, mm -hmm. right, to get started with our Linwood students. Hello, good evening, school board. Good evening, families and community members. I'm Jillian McGilvery. I'm the proud principal of Linwood Elementary School. And I am thrilled to be here with some wonderful student leaders. These are some of our fifth graders who've done some really, really great work at Linwood over the course of the year. They're going to share that with you tonight. Good evening, Dr. Rushi and school board members. I am Molly Moore, president of Linwood Student Ambassadors. The cabinet members and I, along with some green team representatives, are here today to tell you about what we've been up to at Linwood this year. In the past, two students from each class in fourth and fifth grade were selected to be in the student ambassadors, which led to few committees and teachers doing most of the work. This year, however, in fifth grade, the fifth grade students were selected to be committee leaders and any fifth or fourth graders were allowed to join any committee they had interest in. This created much more of a much more student involvement and allowed for a greater number of students to participate in the school. The purpose of Linwood Student Ambassadors is to help students have more of a say in what happens in our school and give students leadership opportunities. Our main goals this year were to get a gaga ball pit for our recess yard and help with the Super Bowl of Caring fundraiser. We have successfully met our goals and we hope to continue to make Linwood and Havertown a better place. Now I'll hand it over to the Vice President. Hello, my name is Emily Roach and I'm the Vice President. Part of my leadership is to lead the Bigs and Littles Committee. Bigs and Littles is an activity our school does where younger kids will hang out with older kids and do fun activities. They will do this for about 30 minutes once a month. Our committee plans what they will be doing and they will make sure everything works out and that they have fun. Thank you for your time and next up 
is our school treasurer. Hi, my name is Emily Kaptyra and I'm, the f I'm in the fundraising committee. Um, we help donate, uh, we help do donate for the Super Bowl of Caring. The Super Bowl of Caring is based on a food, don food donation by students that, and we give to people in need. Each student got specific food to bring, each grade got specific food to bring in if they choose to. In the years past, it was grade against grade to win the Super Bowl. The fundraising committee came up with the, the idea for Slime Wars. Slime Wars was a fundraiser, fundraiser toward getting a Gaga ball pit. If each student chose to, they would bring in some in money to give to, the great, to that grade's team of teachers. In the end, the fifth grade te teachers and our principal, Ms. McGilvery, won, this, this, won and got slimed with real slime. The extra money that we got, got some of, will be added to the student ambassador budget and will be donated to the children of Ukraine. The student ambassador budget is extra money that we keep to use for things like bigs and middles, arts and crafts. Next up is the inclusion coordinator. Hi, I'm Allison Cannon and I'm the inclusion coordinator. Things we did this year was we delivered boxes full of supplies to kids who were new to the school this year we collected posters of some linwood lions family traditions and we hung up posters all around the school with kindness quotes now i'm passing this off to the historian <laughs> good evening i'm jane deal and i'm the leader of the historian committee i have 10 people in my group including me in my committee we take pictures of classes in each specific grade for our group. We have a max of four people per group. Um, my committee and I, we take f photos of the kids from kindergarten to fifth grade. My committee and I work together and then separate into groups to take the best photos possible. We take photos of special events or dates and head to every classroom. We take the pictures that we have got and put them in the yearbook. Now on to public relation. My name is Graham Rizzo and I'm in charge of the public relation committee. Our committee is on the morning announcements every morning around 8.47 for around one minute. We talk about the weather for the day, the sports updates that will happen that day, jokes and more interesting facts. We spread the joy and lighten up the day. Here is the art director. Hello, my name is Stone and I'm the art director. This is what the art committee has done so far. We have made a Linwood pride sign. We have encouraging posters around the school and we have photo booth props for literacy night. Another bonus is that we have safety posters around the school so people know how to be safe. Next up is uh, the green team. Hi everybody, I am Ilsa Jansen. I'm Carly O'Hara. We are on the green team. On the screen, you can see what the green, what the green team is and what we've done. We, held a, we had a campus cleanup where all the grades cleaned up our playground and fields. The green team made posters for the younger grades so they could understand recycling versus trash. We had a walk or bike to school day. It was so successful that they had to park their bikes on the light post because the bike rack was so full. Now we're gonna hand it off to the safety committee director. Hi, my name is Gracie Logan and I'm the leader of the safety committee this year. We have fourth and fifth grader safety committee members in the hallway in the morning and afternoons to encourage students students to follow expected behaviors. I had meetings with staff members to organize safety committee members on the buses. We also visited morning meetings to talk about what staff behaviors look like. We collaborated with the art committee to create posters for the hallway, encouraging safe behaviors. Finally, we collaborated with the PR committee to have safety reminders on the morning announcements. Now I will pass it on to the recess director. Hi, my name is Delaney Keenan and I'm the leader of the recess committee. This year, our committee made videos demonstrating how to use the new recess equipment safely. 
We also worked with the fundraising committee to raise enough money to have a goggleball pet at school. Finally, our fifth graders participated in a basketball game against the Linwood staff. We, what we learned about our leadership from this experience is that anyone can be a leader as long as they are determined and willing to put in the hard work and effort. What we learned about working in a group is that you don't have to do everything yourself. A good team works together well and makes the job fun. In the future, we hope to be leaders in our jobs at, such as doctors, presidents, sports, players, coaches, teachers, actors, and much more. Thank you. As you can see, we have a very, very strong group of leaders here. Uh, Mr. Horan, they are ready for you, ready for the middle school. They're going to continue to do great things. We've had so much fun together at Linwood with the different activities and special events they've planned. Um, and they're just a wonderful, wonderful group of students. So thank you for having us here tonight to share. I'd just like to say that it sounds like your committees are a lot more fun than our board committees. <laughs> oh. And so maybe somebody, maybe you could talk to me about the green slime thing, because I think oh, we could. There was a lot of slime. <laughs> if, if you were somebody who poured slime on a teacher's or a principal's head, raise your hand. <laughs> it was a great day at Linwood. That's a lot of slime. <laughs> yeah. And no, I just want to say, as someone who has a second grader at Linwood, I think it's amazing all the fun stuff that you guys have put together for the students. My second grader loves it. And Graham, when you were saying the announcements, you share interesting information, all your sports information that you share. My little guy comes home and sometimes he'll be like, when is that Sixers game on tonight? <laughs> and before we even ask Alexa, he'll be like, oh yeah, in the morning announcements, they told me it's 645. He knows, <laughs> he loves it. So you guys are doing an awesome job. Thank you. One question. I so I don't know what Gaga Ball is or Gaga Ball Pit is, and I. The big deal. N I understand. I and I've known just been trying to figure it out, but is Limbo now the first school that has said Gaga Ball Pit? We're gonna say yes. <laughs> it is, right. We think yes. These these students have worked so hard, and all kindergarten through fifth graders have worked for it, and. They had some setbacks, just like when ordering anything right now. It was a little delayed. They had to change courses. They had to gather together and select a different model than the one that they chose. But they were very determined to have it installed while they were still fifth graders so that they could play with it. So it happened a couple of weeks ago. It's been great. All right. Well done. Thank you. And then you might want to stick around for just a couple of things. We'll have the middle school and the high school report after we recognize our student representatives for the board. Um, but then after that, I'll be sure to make sure you will all be invited to exit if you want to not stick around for the rest of the business portion. <laughs> right before all those committee reports that some of us are bored by. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Mrs. Wiedemann. Thanks. Well, it's that time of the year again where we are recognizing our students who have dedicated so much of their time all throughout the school year for the purpose of keeping the board informed of the many different happenings that are occurring all throughout the schools that they attend. Um, and they cover not just what they themselves are interested and participate in, but they find out a lot of other things that are happening in, in the schools. As I said, share that, that information with us tonight, uh, each evening. So tonight we want to recognize their dedication uh, and express our appreciation uh, for the time that they have, sp have spent here with us. And they've been able to do this amidst all of the other activities that they are involved in. Our first student that we're going to uh, recognize from the middle school, um, Ian Slavich. And Ian, not only is he our board reporter, uh, but as an eighth grade student, he's very involved with the unified sports basketball and handball. Uh, he's an active Boy Scout. We saw him very interested attend most of the day of the bus rodeo down at our transportation, transportation garage. And I know that the drivers appreciated having you there che cheering them on. So Ian, on behalf of the, the board, uh, I would like to say thank you for the time that you've spent and the reporting that you have delivered so nicely. Anytime. All right. <laughs> Ms. Wiedemann, Mr. Feinberg, do you want to come up and we'll start to get a picture? Great. Okay. 
Isabella Casado also uh, attends our board meetings, keeping us informed amidst all of her activities as an eighth grade student. Uh, she is part of the Heritage Appreciation Club. She's a member of the cheerleading squad, the lacrosse team. Uh, and we, again, appreciate all of the time um, that Isabella spends uh, here with us. She is up oh, there. You go. Sorry. I can't really say I'm not real tall myself. So I <laughs> Seventh grade student Liam Pinder, in addition to being a board representative, is a member of the soccer team, the wrestling team. Um, he clearly enjoys chess. He's part of the chess club and vice president of the Best Buddies Club at the middle school. So Liam, thank you for fitting us in among the, all of the activities. <laughs> Bianca Salerno is a sixth grade student uh, who has fit us in among her activities of being peer assistance group, a member of the chorus, member of chamber choir. She's an actor and acting, uh, a dancer. Uh, she plays the piano. Uh, and we've often said we could learn a little bit of public speaking <laughs> when, she's, when she starts. Uh, so thank you for, again, fitting us in among your busy schedule. And these are the individuals, the young people who have served in the capacity of, of school board representative uh, for the 21-22 uh, school year. We also have two students from our, our high school who regularly attend um, our board meetings and again keep us up to date on all of the happenings at the high school which we can see hear from them every time they report is an extremely busy place to report upon uh, so in addition to reporting on activities that they themselves may be involved in they are also actively finding out what else again is taking place throughout the school uh, they've got many activities that they are involved in themselves as recent as yesterday uh, i saw mia at the delaware county intermediate unit for a student forum uh, participating in in that as well uh, so there's a lot that our students are involved in and continue to be uh, involved in uh, we're hopeful that we will have so our high school students um, back with us in some capacity but for now we want to thank amelia gonzalez uh, for joining us and and reporting Is amelia here? Great. <laughs> and Mia Diewald. And now we will hear from those student reporters. <laughs> and we will start with our middle school student reporter tonight, Bianca Salerno. Good evening, everybody. My name is Bianca Salerno, and I'm so happy to be here tonight. I'm on what some might call an adrenaline rush and some might call flat out craziness because I just sprinted here from the sixth grade spring concert where I was so grateful to have a solo in. The concert ended at 729 and this started at 730 so you can imagine my dilemma. Time to shake off those jitters and get right into this. Everyone in chorus is so talented and we're so lucky for our incredible Mrs. Langley and the whole musical staff. 
It wouldn't be the end of the year at HMS without Potter Cup. I can still hear the cheers of HMS students for our teams and the screaming of our favorite songs at the DJ booth. Two really is better than one when HMS united with Paxson Hollow Middle School to raise money for Alex's lemonade stand. Even though it's completely, entirely, 100% about the fun of it, HMS did win this year. <laughs> one of the many things I love about our school is the opportunity for everyone to make a difference and be a part of something. That's why the Peer Assistance Group, PAG, was recognized by the Delaware County Intermediate Unit for the Making a Difference Award. PAG has always been so special to me and I have so much fun interacting with all my friends and learning about each other. It seems as if just yesterday I was at this meeting telling all of you about how we can't wait for Camp Canadensis coming up in the future. But now it's really here. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grades will be riding up to Camp Canadensis on separate days. The sixth grade trip is in 11 days and 11 hours, but who's counting? Definitely not me. The season of giving is truly all year round because we are collecting new and gently used middle school size clothing for cradles to crowns during the week of May 23rd with a Saturday, May 28th drop off time as well. And we can't forget about the district art show that is scheduled for May 24th to 26th and will be held at Haverford Middle School in Gym D. All the paint stained clothing of students will finally pay off when you see all the hard work grades K to 12 put in their art. It is our great pride and honor that our 7th Heaven Choir Ensemble will be performing the national anthem at the Phillies game on Tuesday, May 31st. As a person who aspires to be in 7th Heaven next year, I'm so proud of this accomplishment and we can't wait to see them shine. As the school year takes its final stretch, a lot will be happening to ensure maximum learning and fun are locked into our memories to look back on during summer, especially for 8th grade, which will be moving up to the trusted hands of Haverford High School in 9th grade. Middle school is a huge part of youth, and we will be celebrating all of these eighth graders who've worked so hard with a dance, honors night, and clap out. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today and all the previous times as well. Enjoy the rest of your night and go Fords. And our high school student reporter tonight is Mia Dewell. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mia Dewald, and I thank you for allowing me to present on behalf of the high school tonight. It has been a busy week for students. AP testing wrapped up last week, and although it isn't my favorite time of year, teachers prepared me very well, and I'm eagerly awaiting receiving my scores in July. Underclassmen began their keystones for algebra, English, and biology earlier this week. With under a month left of school, students have definitely been working harder than ever. This past Tuesday was the annual senior breakfast where seniors were given a chance to celebrate their hard work and begin some of the end of year festivities. Next Friday will be a half day in which students will participate in a new wellness block, giving students time to unwind and practice some mindfulness while spending time with the teacher of their choice. During this time, I will be going to visit my English teacher from my freshman year for some coloring, which I'm honestly very excited for. <laughs> This past weekend, Haverford Science Academy held their annual Discover Day and hosted elementary students for some exciting science demonstrations and interactive activities. The Drama Club's production of Mamma Mia concluded with a bang, and after being nominated for 15 Cappies Awards, Caleb Schmidt and the Haverford Orchestral Pit successfully won an award for Best Pit Performance. Congratulations to them. The Haverford Orchestras came together for the first time in two years to perform at String Night just last night, and concluded with the joint finale in which middle school and high school students played together. I remember participating in this when I was in middle school and it was truly surreal to be on the other side of this experience, especially with this being Mr. Brennan's last concert. Best Buddies will also be holding their annual rain rally tomorrow with the help of our wonderful fire department to support the unified bocce and track teams. I had the privilege of attending the Delaware County Student Forums event, Delco Under Construction at the DCIU yesterday, as Dr. Rushi said, and to say it was informative would be an understatement. Over the course of a few hours, I attended numerous presentations led by students and administrators discussing the importance of topics such as mental health, dignity, and the environment in the school place. During this time, I was also able to watch a presentation given by Haverford's own Mr. Smith as he talked about the importance of representation in the educational field. Haverford's athletes have not shown any signs of slowing down as the boys lacrosse and volleyball teams played playoff games earlier this week. Senior nights are once again a reminder of how quickly time is flying by with softball and lacrosse having theirs earlier this month. Aubrey Lena Weaver recently broke down Don Burrell's county record in the 300 hurdles in the track and field world. Softball player Emma Taylor was also admitted to the PA Sports Hall of Fame in the Delco chapter earlier this week. 
Congratulations to them both for making Haverford proud. The girls softball team will begin their playoff tournament next week in an attempt to make it back to state finals at Penn State this year. As months breeze by and finals are the last hurdle left in the school year, students will keep up the hard work in the classroom and on the field. Thank you again for allowing me time to speak tonight. Thank you. We're now moving into the more business part of our agenda with Dr. Rushi's superintendent report, but if you would like to exit now, you're welcome to do so. I won't take any offense. <laughs> thank you sure, for coming. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Well done, thank guys. you for bringing your children here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Emily. Great job, Jane. <laughs> Good job, guys. Thank you. Thanks so, thanks so much Thank for coming tonight. Good job. <laughs> Man, I heard you won big last night. <laughs> And it looks like we'll have a little more room on this side of the, <laughs> of the meeting room if people want to move in and spread out. <laughs> Oh, you can. I'm, I'm all right with you. It's, it's brief enough. Mm -hmm. All right. Dr. Rushi, time for your remarks. Great. Thank you, Ms. Wiedemann. Uh, and I'm going to get right into the two items listed below superintendent's comments. First being the discussion of the revisions to the health and health and safety plan. Um, when we last updated, brought forth um, an updated plan to the board, it was at a point in time before the CDC had changed their metrics to what they are now terming community levels. Uh, they have moved away from looking at uh, positivity rate uh, as a sole descriptor of you know, when levels to indicate when masks would be recommended, highly recommended when masking would, would be required. Within our original plan, which was based off of the Pennsylvania Department of Health guidance and designed as a way to prevent a possible school closure based on that guidance, uh, we looked at setting up a 3% threshold if the 3% of the total building population, that would include the students and the staff members in the building. If the building reached a 3% threshold for a period of seven days, then we would move back to masking required. But we are no longer operating under that guidance as the Pennsylvania Department of Health has informed us that they are now aligned with and following the new CDC guidance. So the change that we are proposing tonight, which by the way, our current health and safety plan runs through June 30th of 2022. So any discussion that we have about this plan tonight, a future vote, uh, to make a change in this plan uh, impacts a time period from now until June 30th. What will be required in terms of a health and safety plan for the 22-23 school year has yet to be determined and communicated to us. We do believe that we will need a plan, that one will be required, uh, but the elements of that plan have not been communicated at this point in time. So I can't stress enough that what we are talking about now impacts between this point in time or when a vote would be taken and June 30th, 2022. There is nothing that we are deciding now that will have any impact upon the opening of the 22-23 school year. The CDC have, has moved to something that they are describing and they have titled community levels because the belief that, that to help communities look at the prevention steps that would be taken based upon hospital admissions, uh, the a population within a certain community, the rate of cases within that community. So they're not just looking at the number of positive cases, but what is the implication in terms of hospitalizations? Something that we have no way of, of calculating. We need to rely on an outside source for that information. 
And the model that we're working with now, we're doing our calculations based on counts of what is, you know, what's reported to us in terms of positive cases. So we're using a model that essentially is outdated in terms of looking at the positivity instead of looking at what has now been termed community levels. The CDC does state that when you get to that highest community level, uh, that there is the recommendation that people would be wearing masks indoors. Uh, but right now, Delaware County is at, even as recent as today, if you look at the CDC website, Delaware County, the community level is identified as low. So our recommendation uh, is that would be that we would revise that plan accordingly, align it to community levels and move away from that 3% as our barometer to decide when people are wearing masks. Uh, we can still you know, encourage people to wear masks. Uh, we certainly would not tell people to, to stop wearing masks. Uh, they can choose to wear a mask, but we would stop that calculation of the percentage each and every day based on the cases that are reported to us. That's the only change that we are proposing to make to the plan. There's really no need to propose any other change um, given that we don't know what will be required moving forward. And this is a plan that sunsets, so to speak, uh, on June 30th. So our next proposal to you tonight is that we would have that's Tuesday, May 24th, not Thursday, um, that we would have, <laughs> that's all right, we would have a special meeting so that we not wait. Our next regularly scheduled board meeting is June 2nd. Uh, and given the proximity to the close of the school year, uh, we would ask that the board would meet on Tuesday, May 24th. We can have a special meeting uh, that would be scheduled at, at 6.30. That would be the special meeting would be for the purpose of taking the vote on the recommended change to the 21 uh, Esther Health and Safety Plan that runs through June 30th of 2022. Questions? Any questions or comments from the board? I do have a question. Oh, sorry. Dr. King, go ahead. Um, so, Dr. Rushi, can you clarify um, what would be the our plan for a school where we're noticing an increase in numbers, um, whether it's a specific classroom where we're seeing an increase in positive cases or just a school, particular school, um, that we're seeing an increase in positive COVID cases? If the board wishes for us to keep a dashboard, mm -hmm. uh, we would keep a dashboard that would identify the case count each one of those days. We would stop the calculation that we're now conducting, looking at seven days, what is the percentage of that number based on the total enrollment and uh, a number of adults working in that building. So we can still put what are the number of cases uh, and you know, encourage people to monitor that, but we would not be mandating at any time that people would return to masks. Would there still be would, would there be notifications sent for for schools that did have a spike? We'd have to decide what the threshold is. Like, what's the threshold if we're going to send a you know a notification? Uh, we can do things like asking principals in the communication that they send out to remind people. You know, the dashboard is there. You can you know take a look. The dashboard is updated each day with the count that people can take a look at that and, and see the count. I'm just you know, processing it in my mind. What would, what would the barometer be to say, now you should pay attention to it, whereas last week we didn't tell you to pay attention to okay. it. Could, could the threshold for notification be 3%? Well, it could be anything that we want it to be. I was trying, I'm trying to move away from conducting a calculation that right now we are the only ones using that. There's no health authority looking at the percentage of people who occupy a building and the percentage of people and what the number is of people who test positive and report it. So I guess what I'm wondering is um, thinking about the impact, like the whole point of the health and safety plan, as I've said before, is to keep um, students and teachers and staff safe and in person um, you know, receiving in-person education, um, in-person schooling. So I guess my concern would be, 
you know, do we still have the same protocols? Like if a student tests positive or a teacher tests positive, are they out for, you know, X number of days still? Is that going to start impacting? That's like what are their options for receiving? Um, I mean, are, are kids completely out of school during that time? Um, no, they're out for five. They are, if they test positive, they're out for five days. And there's no virtual, no hybrid, no, I mean, I guess I'm trying to reconcile like these levels and then also like the level and quality of education that students are still able to receive. Um, because I think if we are approaching 3% or higher um, of positivity rates in our schools or classrooms, like we're just, it's gonna really impact kids' education. We would still look at, as we do any communicable disease, so something like whooping cough is considered a communicable disease, and that we reach out to the health department, and they would guide us in terms of send a letter, you know, we've all gotten the lice letter as parents, <laughs> you know, like send a letter to the classroom or send a letter to the school, or no, you don't have to send a letter based on, you know, it's just one, one case that you have. So we would still do that type of outreach for a commu you know, communicable type disease. Um, I would also say that if we're finding that the 3%, even now if we found the 3% of preponderance of that was in one classroom, one elementary classroom that you, you know, would have right now, the number is, you know, in one of the buildings is up over 20 students, if that like was all within one classroom or one grade level, we would be communicating that, but we would communicate it because it's contained within that particular room or that particular grade level. So those, I'm not suggesting that we walk away from this altogether, um, but I am recommending that we stop this calculation and using that number as everybody in the building must wear, must wear a mask. I just wanna add that I, I really appreciate this move, um, you know, throughout the past two years, a lot of times we haven't had such guidance. And so we do, we have the guidance now from our national health authority um, who is telling us this is, this is sort of what has turned in to be important. And so, you know, looking at case counts, I think at one time was really, really important. That's what we had to go off of. And that's, that's what, um, you know, was the biggest indicator of the threat level. Um, and I think moving towards, again, what has been recommended by the health authority would, would keep us focused on what actually is, um, would, would be an indicator of a potential threat level. And so I think that that just puts it in line and hopefully helps folks understand what they need to be looking for for their own um, calculation of whether they want to be, you know, wearing the mask or, or um, you know, what, what what they want to do. So um, I really appreciate this change. Um, and, you know, it's a shame that it happened after our previous vote. Um, you know, I think we saw that happen a lot uh, during the pandemic. But um, I think moving towards what has been recommended by our health officials is the right move. I also agree with what Antoinette just said. I think this is the right move to, move, to go in this direction following the guidance of the CDC. And now, as Antoinette said before, it was more about case counts. Now, I think seeing how the virus has changed, looking at hospitalizations, that seems to make a lot more sense. I do think maybe keeping the dashboard, because there are going to be some families um, who do want that information, makes mm -hmm. sense. And that would be my only recommendation. Um, so also, just looking at the way this is reading, um, I'm looking where the change is in the document. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, this might just be the way I'm reading it, but it doesn't quite, it's not quite clear. It feels like there is the actual, um, the way we're going to now go about things based on the CDC guidance. And then after that comes the, the way that we should be determining how we're going to be looking at CDC guidance. I feel like the order is out of whack there. Like, I feel like the, per the CDC update, March 24th, and then that first paragraph during times when the CDC COVID blah, 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 that would come after that after? paragraph. It's like okay. based on this, you know, this updated guidance, you know, we will do this during times and look at community levels. Um, okay. Just so it reads more clearly. We can make that change. I'm wondering if <clears throat> um, there 
could be a notification when if we if our community level does change to go into the high level um the, the cdc website is a little bit wonky and i mean you have to i don't know maybe it's because i was looking at it on my phone today but i also checked today you know looking at the agenda that this was on it and, and we are in a, a low um community transmission level but i'm not sure that everyone would be following it enough to know and so you know if because that would change you know it would now be highly recommended in our schools and so just to let folks know this is per the health and safety report it's now highly recommended due to the cdc categorizing us as the high level can someone else check that link because it actually just says that we're high and i'm not sure if i'm looking at the wrong name it says delaware county pennsylvania is in the high i checked it earlier today and it said low i know that's what others have said but i just i don't can you just click on it and double check me <laughs> I know it doesn't change what we're passing or discussing. It does but. change on Thursdays is when they update it. At 820? <laughs> <laughs> we're getting real good now. Yeah, right? no, I mean, this is this is creepy. I mean, They're I following just, us. <laughs> I just clicked on it and it says hi. So I just, if someone else could check that. We will. That's what I'm seeing. So we're at the high? Um, are we at the high? Okay. okay. That's what it looks like. Um, wow. So I, the, we are at the high right now. Does anyone have a mask? <laughs> it literally went. It was low this yeah, morning when I checked. <laughs> wow. Oh, great. <clears throat> Can I ask a question? The the 5% threshold, that was by the state health department? Mm -hmm. or is that something yes. where we still have to do, or is that no longer a thing? We, that's no longer. Like, we don't have to have to do that anymore. okay so nothing happens if we get not to five percent or anything really no okay not. okay just curious um are we are we also encouraging people when we are starting to see high levels within a classroom or within a grade level or something a building are we also encouraging people to test even if they're asymptomatic because we have not had that yet but so i would imagine that we would okay. I'm, I mean, I'm just looking at nicole but we've not had an concentrated um, high percentage within one particular classroom or at okay. one particular grade level but okay. this mm -hmm. Nicole is saying it's it's been mostly within a family mm -hmm. okay. the CDC guidance is to get tested if you have symptoms mm -hmm. not okay. asymptomatic okay. so we would put we can put some communication together if we see those percentages high i mean you know we wouldn't ignore that we would treat that like we do other communicable diseases okay. and notify people and, and then refer them at that time to the cdc website okay. we can do that okay. Okay. And going back to miss snodgrass's point i think it would be great if you know we have this recommendation built in that when we are at the high level it is recommended you wear a mask just you know that we are informing the community when the levels do change mm -hmm. yeah because they can change in the middle of a meeting. <laughs> Within hours. Right. Yep. So just for a point of clarification, so now we're all looking at the website. Um, <laughs> if this was the case, Dr. Rushi, and I guess Thursday is the, the day where they, they update it, you're saying, like Bridget? Yeah, so, no, it's, yeah. Okay, so if this was the case, we come here, we see this, what would happen tomorrow? Well, in the, we'll be sending communication home tomorrow anyway to notify the community of this meeting tonight and the um, potential of a special meeting on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And we will include in there that here's a link to the CDC website. We are at, you know, we are at high. So masks are highly, I, I would use their words. I won't use any of mine. Masking is highly recommended. So I guess that's that's the part of a part that I want to be clear about. So when I'm reading this, it says in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, community level is high. Wear a mask indoors. I don't see language unless I'm missing it that says highly recommended. I'm looking right underneath here. So are we saying highly recommended when it's high? Or are we just saying wear a mask when it's high? And I think we need to be very clear about um, whatever is being proposed for the next vote so that we're all on the same page. Well, there they also do not have the word required in there. And that's what makes a difference for us. Okay. So we would be saying that it is highly recommended that people wear masks indoors. Okay. Mm. And so this is then aligning the schools with 
the same advice that the CDC has mm -hmm. for people circulating in any, 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 any mm -hmm. activity in society, right? That these, these are not unique to schools, nor are they unique mm -hmm. to any other setting. Um, this recommendation in high to wear a mask. Um, and I think it's also correct to say that this is the strategy that many of our neighboring districts and districts around the state have chosen to align with, given that it's um, matching and consistent with CDC's now current practices and has that alignment with the recommendation for people in their daily lives in general. Yes. Um, I will note that you hear on the website, it says it's updated Thursdays at 8 p.m. So <laughs> this is just okay. um, <laughs> We have, for people who have been watching this, um, the map has changed mm -hmm. last week. You saw more of the mediums um, in some of the neighboring counties and, and states. So um, it is a, you know, a way to track risks and I think gives, you know, hopefully is, is an indicator for people who want to make decisions about masking or about the ways that they, you know, how it's socializing and contact they have with people, they can certainly take this into account. Um, and I think Dr. Rishi's point about mm -hmm. having COVID become more in the category of the other communicable diseases that schools have long dealt with. We now have a, a new health department that hopefully, you know, will be a resource and, and um, be able to advise us if there were kind of changes, changes or or things like that that were a concern and then that information can be communicated but um, you know I think aligning it with the CDC community level which again was a concept released after we last reviewed the plan um, mm -hmm. seems to make sense at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Just really quickly add that because we're talking about the CDC guidance, um, the, the main guidance that I think is coming from the CDC and really all health authorities is to be vaccinated. Um, and if you haven't gotten your children vaccinated or if any of your younger children have recently turned five and have become eligible for the vaccine, that's really what's going to help us the most and make this um, you know, less of a threat. And I think that was part of going towards counting hospitalizations more than just counting cases, because we see that people who are vaccinated very often have um, less severe symptoms. So again, you know, if you're waiting, if you haven't gotten your booster, um, you know, please, please do that. And related to that, are there any booster clinics or um, vaccination clinics coming up? Um, I know we've hosted some in the past, but is, are there any future plans for those? Uh, we have not been approached, nor have we reached out to anyone uh, about the clinics. I think vaccines are pretty available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, hopefully folks, uh, you know, there is, I think, Pennsylvania um, website, CDC website, you can find your location for a vaccine. So you sh hopefully should not have a, an issue finding one. Right. The, when we when the district did host vaccine clinics, that was when it was uh, newer to be yeah. eligible for school age students. And right. so we were able to host that and support that for our school age students. Any other comments or discussion? All right, we will um, be then prepared to vote on this on Tuesday, May 24th, 6.30, a special meeting. I guess it should be clear that our current health and safety plan until we take that vote remains in effect. And so if there are schools that go to the 3% level between now and Tuesday, they would they would need to follow our current health and safety plan of masking, right? Yes, there is a, one of our buildings, the building principal did send communication to parents last mm -hmm. evening, letting them know to continue to monitor the mm -hmm. chart because they, at that time, they were their third day at 3%. And now it seems that we're in high, so we should also be recommending broadly <laughs> masking because yes. that's the level that our community is at. Um, figures that there's all these changes, right? Yes. <laughs> as, as we're in the yeah. Mid literally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, to move on? Yes, great. All right. um, the second item that I wish to share with you this evening as an information, uh, uh, okay. 
um, as an information item, uh, not for a vote tonight. We would bring it forward at another time, the June 2nd meeting for a vote. This is the calendar for the academic year 2023-2024. Um, just for the benefit of the public, the 2022-2023 calendar, that's already been approved. <laughs> that's next school year's calendar, so that is on the website already. This would be for the following school year. Um, point, a few things to point out there. Uh, the first day of school for students would be Tuesday, September 5th. Uh, we also identify dates on which our facilities would not be available in the evening in observance uh, of uh, holidays or the day itself um, when the holiday is being observed. That is identified on the calendar. Also, usually of high interest, uh, the spring break week, uh, we have been able to identify the Monday after spring break as an in-service day uh, for teachers. So that means that the children would not be in school. Uh, that is April Fool's Day for <laughs> in April of, of 2024. Um, but the, you know, the most important target that we do look at here is the what is the last student day. And in 2024, June 14th, which is a Friday, would be the last student day. One of our goals is always to end on either a Thursday or Friday and not have kids having to come in for one or two days uh, that, follow, that following week. Um, give families the opportunity to get a, a clean start um, on these on the summer. Um, also of note, in usually there's a day in May for the primary uh, in 2024. That is not in May. That's an, actually an April date. So that's why you will see um, April 23rd, which is a Tuesday, identified as an in-service day. So students would not be in the building um, during the voting on that, that particular year. That's a bigger election that day. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Election day, November, looks like it's also, the building is closed, yes. November 7th, 2023. Yes, the building is closed that day for, for to students. students. <clears throat> it is an in-service day. Thank you for noting about the election day in May, because I looked on the calendar and I thought, oh, we're not, having that and having just gone through, not a big fan of students being in school, especially at mm -hmm. Linwood with, you know, the children in the building and people being able to enter and um, apparently, you know, it caused a lot of issues with people trying to access even when they were voting with the, caf with the cafeteria becoming the voting center. Um, I think someone tried to drive down during the day onto the blacktop when children were still there to park who needed um, easier access because it's not really easy for people to, um, older people, people with um, disabilities to walk from the top parking spaces all the way down. And I believe someone tried to uh, park when the children were still there going right down onto the blacktop. So I appreciate the children having the day off that day. That makes a lot of sense. So thank you for clarifying sure. that. Mm -hmm. So we will bring this, you know, if there's any more feedback as you take a look at it, please let our board leadership know and we will bring this back for a vote at the June 2nd meeting. Okay, sorry, just a question about um, the, I guess the Easter Monday, um, April 1st. So are teachers, are they required to attend those days? I'm just thinking if people have vacations, like some teachers might extend their That's vacation. That's yet to be determined because we do have an element where um, some of our professional development is what's described as flex. Okay. So teachers can participate in professional development um, for a number of hours after school, uh, sometimes depending on what they're doing, even full day things on a Saturday, some have, have been able to do that. Okay. Um, and then that counts towards a flex day. So the flex day, which in service days will become flex days have not been decided yet. Thank you. All right, and then we'll have to just get our heads around 23, 24. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm. The next item on the agenda is uh, the first public comment period. We had nobody signed up for that discussion. 
So we will go next to our board reports, beginning with the facility and finance committee report from Dave Schwartz. Okay, thanks. So a um, couple of, of items on the on the facility and finance agenda. The first one are construction, are construction updates on the schools. Now, I'll keep it pretty short. Linwood is almost done. A few, uh, st a few things still remaining, removing a few items, seating. We're still waiting on the fencing, supply chain issues, but that is on its way. High school phase one is also undergoing the kind of final phases, final inspections, cleanup, those kinds of things. High school phase two is uh, ramping up right now. The interior being started, I believe the roof is, um, is, is up now. So those things um, are, are, are ongoing. A couple of items are coming up for change orders from the larger items that have been, that, that the board has been briefed upon earlier. Um, <clears throat> Chatham Park and Coopertown are also both just starting right now. Some of the second shift work is being done now. That's going to get started um, in earnest once the school year ends. And that's pretty much the update for the, um, for, for the schools. Also was an update on some of the um, bid results and some of the, th and some of the, um, some of the, uh, things w associated with the M&T lot. Uh, the, the maintenance and transportation lot is being redone this year. It's a long time coming. I guess COVID kind of put the brakes on that for a bit, but, 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 but we are now looking um, to, to redo that. A lot of bids were received. If you're interested in looking at those, those are on the facility and finance committee meeting minutes. And the final item that was discussed was a um, food service procurement review by the state. Uh, the state decided to give us a review during COVID while we had just changed our food service providers and changed our business manager. So they had a couple of suggestions of some, th some corrective actions that, that we have to take regarding invoice um, and, and reporting that is underway to, to be corrected. A couple of additional um, uh, uh, Recommendations were also made at, at, as well. Those are also being reviewed um, as of right now. And if you want more information on any of the, uh, the construction updates or MT paving, it's up on the website. Thank you. The next committee report is the policy committee with Antoinette Snodgrass. Great, thank you. Um, we had a great policy committee meeting this past Monday. Um, we had a very ambitious agenda um, because, um, again, we're doing a policy audit where over approximately five years we look at all of our policies. Um, so we started the audit in January of this year. Um, we have been uh, systematically looking at them uh, sort of by group. and. Um, Right now, we are in the community section, um, looking at um, items like communication with the community and um, really how the community interacts with the district. Um, several of the policies that we reviewed had, had been discussed in committee before, and we were trying to sort of uh, complete those items and then also keep up with our uh, ambitious policy schedule. Um, to be able to review um, all of our policies within our timeline. Um, just so folks know, this, I don't think the board, at least in the last um, 20 some years, um, has had a policy audit. And so several of our policies are very outdated. Um, we had, it looks like there was a big policy review in 2010 because, or at least a lot of the policies are from 2010. And then we also have a lot from 1999. Um, so it's definitely timely um, and uh, that, that we're doing this. We um, first discussed um, two policies that we had reviewed before in the committee, 919 civility and 920 communications. Um, the committee discussed the 919 proposed policy, which is not a current policy of ours, and came to the conclusion that it's not something that the district needs. Um, we have very good policies um, on other prohibited b behavior that we felt, the policy committee felt um, would uh, be able to uh, 
be used in any scenario that we felt was egregious enough to um, potentially implicate that uh, proposed policy. So we will not be moving forward and recommending for the board that policy. Um, the other two policies that were um, from previous committee meetings, uh, again, a proposed policy for communications um, and uh, a policy 006.1 for potentially um, having either virtual component of the meeting, uh, such as one necessary per, uh, uh, member of the meeting, presenter at the meeting participating, or for having full board meetings. We did not, um, un unfortunately, come to a conclusion on either one of those, so those are going back to committee again. Um, communications will be um, uh, replacing at least one of our policies. Several of our policies overlapped, uh, especially ones that had to do with the media and had to do with uh, communications outward from the district. And so we are combining uh, those and really just changing that policy to be more updated. More to come on that one. And then 006.1 meetings. Um, again, the board pretty much decided that they did not want to have, well, we haven't decided, but it, it there was a, a contingent that decided that they would not favor one single member of the board um, participating virtually. So again, that one's going back into committee. Um, two policies we also briefly discussed, 904 public attendance at school events and 906 public complaints um, had become, had, had come in front of the board for a first reading before, but since the civility policy was still in committee and it turns out we did not pass the civility policy um, to recommend it for the full board, uh, they were just to go back to committee to review um, based on their references to the civility policy. Just briefly, we also discussed policy 907, school visitors, policy 908, relations with parents and guardians, and policy 909, municipal government relations. Um, we had, the board had a lot of changes to each one of them, mostly for updating. Um, several of them had been, I mean, w over a decade before they, uh, since they had last been reviewed. So those were, um, those were updates that we, I think, we'll see in front of the board soon. Um, not at tonight's meeting, <laughs> um, but um, but I think we gave our solicitors some work um, to to incorporate our comments, and um, the board should be seeing those soon. Um, we only did not get to one policy on our very ambitious agenda, so I do want to thank everyone on the policy committee for working through that, and for our president, uh, Ms. Wiedemann, for. Um, giving us a cutoff to, to reach to so that we didn't talk all night about policies. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right. We are now in the finance facilities portion of the agenda, item six. Item A uh -huh. is the bill list. I welcome a motion to approve disbursements from the following funds as listed. I move. Short second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Bill list is passed. Change orders. Item B. I will accept a motion to accept the recommendation of the project con architect KCBA and Associates Inc. and owner's representative CB Development Services Inc. and authorize the change orders totaling $82,526.26 as listed. King moved. Kristen Court. second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? These were all discussed at the yeah. Yes, these were all facility. the aforementioned uh, change orders that had been discussed at, at, at the facilities meeting. Some of the bigger items are the upgrading the PA system, replacing the fiber optics, all related to high school phase two. Thank you. Any other discussion? Um, just a quick comment. Um, I really like the spreadsheets that Ken Matthews has been providing on updates of all the different projects at the finance and facilities meetings. I think they're really clear. Mm -hmm. And I think it's um, really useful information, especially to compare kind of, because we do it like every month, like month over month to see the changes from month to month. So good job, Ken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just yes, along. I appreciate yeah. a good spreadsheet. So um, <laughs> I just I found that really helpful. Um, and it I, I think it's like a relatively new way he's presenting yes. that to us. So yeah. I like it. Um, for what that's worth. <laughs> I agree. I think it's a good way to track the progress. And then importantly, um, for everybody's benefit at the bottom, it has the amount that is kind of savings, um, you know, that hasn't been already allocated to the budget that is still in our contingency. And if um, we get to the end of these projects, 
uh, that becomes savings for the district to apply to other capital funds and so that's nice and clear and the percentage that's already filled and the percentage remaining like it's just it's a lot of information in a compact little spreadsheet so as long, good as, job, numbers, Matthews. As, long as numbers don't go negative we're in good shape yeah. but yes. yeah. okay so all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed change orders pass item c is a bid award for district concrete work i will accept a motion to approve premier concrete to complete necessary concrete work around the district at the following rates Feinberg move Vitali second moved and seconded any discussion all in favor aye. Aye. aye any opposed motion passes item d is bid awards for the m t the maintenance and transportation paving project I welcome a motion to approve the following vendors to complete the maintenance and transportation paving project at a total cost not to exceed $1,137,771, inclusive of a $50,000 contingency. Crispin, move. Vitaly, second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? motion passes and the buses will get to sit on solid ground again <laughs> that would be nice <laughs> item seven is for human resources item a resignations i'll accept a motion to accept the following resignations as listed Feinberg move crispin second moved and seconded any discussion all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed motion passes Item B is for appointments. I will welcome a motion to approve the following appointments as listed. Larson moved. Vitaly second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The appointments are approved. Item C is leave of absence. I will accept a motion to approve the following leave requests. King moved. Crispin second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. <laughs> Under item eight of the agenda, pupil services is item A, the 2022 ESY extended school year contract approvals. I will welcome a motion to approve the following educational contracts for students attending out of district placements for the 2022 ESY program. Feinberg move. Larson second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. The next item of our agenda where we have business is in section 10 for policy. And item A is to approve policy 903 public participation in board meetings. I will accept a motion to accept changes to policy 903 public participation in board meetings. Snodgrass moved. Crispin second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Um, there were, I think, some changes between the last version and this one based on um, some comments mm -hmm. at the last board meeting. And so um, I think this addresses um, the comments that were made um, to make sure that the public participation at board meetings, our policy reads the way that our practice Mm -hmm. um, you know, follows. <laughs> and so um, I think that um, as the board members hopefully have gotten a chance to review um, that the, the changes that were put into place um, do meet those requirements. Yeah, I think For, it is a better reflection of our actual practices. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. Policy is approved. Item B is now a second reading for school board policies 904 public attendance at school events and policy 906 public complaints. I will accept a motion to acknowledge the first reading of policies 904 and 906 at the April 21st, 2022 board meeting and to accept the second reading of policies 904 and 906 at tonight's meeting. Snodgrass moved. Vitaly second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Um, just really briefly, I mentioned these in my policy committee report. These were, um, they had come to the board for a first meeting already, or for a first reading already. Um, and then we did see that um, the civility policy 
uh, was mentioned in these and had not also been before the board. And so the changes between the first reading and the second reading, which we have tonight, will be you know, they removed the language referring to the policy, which the committee decided not to recommend for the full board. Thank you. Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Under item 11 of the agenda is a discussion of the fair funding resolution. This is just for discussion purposes and I'll turn it over to Larry Feinberg to um, explain a bit about what this resolution is and how it will help. Folks who have been following meetings over the years uh, know that <coughs> I've raised this on uh, several occasions uh, just in terms of keeping the board abreast of uh, the status of this lawsuit it was pending for for about 12 years uh, the suit uh, finally uh, got started uh, uh, I guess back in November um, testimony concluded about six weeks ago uh, and oral arguments uh, will uh, start at the end of July uh, and then it goes to to a judge um, I'm just going to read a couple of the uh, statements from this proposed resolution. It's on the website if folks want to look at it. Uh, but it says, uh, whereas there is substantial evidence that both individual health and economic well-being are tied to educational outcomes, whereas there is ample evidence that community prosperity is related to the quality of education, Whereas when the state fails to adequately fund education, it puts an unfair responsibility on local taxpayers, which cannot be met in low wealth districts, even when paying higher tax rates. Whereas the General Assembly has defined what a thorough education is by identifying educational standards, the standards used in the PSSA and Keystone exams that all Pennsylvania students are expected to meet and whereas the current school funding system in Pennsylvania results in grossly different amounts of money spent on children in different districts in violation of the equal protection provisions of the state constitution with much less money spent on children in low wealth districts, even though their students have additional educational needs. So this would be a, uh, our board voting uh, on a resolution to support the plaintiffs uh, in that case, which include <coughs> parents of individual children, uh, six school districts from around the state, including our neighbor, uh, William Penn, the Pennsylvania Association of Rural and Small Schools, and the Pennsylvania NAACP State Conference. Uh, so I'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions from the board, but I think you have uh, material in your packet and that's I just have one question Larry um you said so it's been going on for 12 years no more than 12 years uh I'm assuming a ruling a, a ruling is coming this year or maybe <laughs> maybe coming this year after that and then it's going to a judge it's not a you know jury obviously is that going to be a, a final rule or will it be or, or will it be appealed and if it's appealed what What's the timeline for that, or do you not? Is, is it hard? It's a good question, Steve, because, um, uh, you know, the short answer on, on the appeal, most likely, um, you know, who knows how much longer they'll stretch it out for. Uh, I think sooner or later, uh, the legislature is going to have to do something. Uh, what that is uh, remains to be seen. In other states that have had similar suits that have been resolved uh, generally the it puts uh, extra pressure on the legislature uh, uh, to come up with uh, significant uh, additional funding and uh, uh, formulas to distribute that, that those funds so we'll we'll have to wait and see and that's and that's assuming that that's found in favor of the plaintiff they would they would then have to it would put an onus on the legislature to to, to make movement to fix the mess that uh and actually what's happened i think as a result of the extra pressure from this lawsuit in the last uh in the current budget and last year's state budget uh they added a 
uh, budget line for what's called level up funding, where they uh, uh, created a budget line, I think it was $100 million extra uh, last year that went to, uh, I believe it was the 100 uh, most underfunded districts. So there has been a little bit of movement. Um, and, you know, the, uh, you know, it's palpable, you know, uh, you know, William Penn is what, three miles down the road from us. And um, in, in so many ways, we, we take, we take it for granted that, that uh, the resources that we have in this district and what we're able to provide to our kids. Um, and it's, it's not fair that, uh, that students three, three miles down the road are using textbooks that are incredibly outdated, uh, are in facilities that are in a, in a much uh, less state of repair, let alone newer facilities. So, um, uh, you know, I hope that there, I hope there's a good outcome to this case. Yeah, I think, you know, Pennsylvania has such disparities. And when I talk to my kids about advocating for public education, I think that's an excellent example that we could walk to schools that where the kids don't have the same opportunities, they don't have the same resources as we do. And that's a community that has taxed all it can and isn't getting more as a result. And um, the state has these mandates. We talk about them often in you know, the range of requirements, add this, do this, certify that, report on this. Um, but they also have these mandates on proficiency for student achievement. And when there's a correlation between funding and student achievement and the state isn't fulfilling its end of the bargain to support the districts where the communities can't put more in, there's um, real injustice there. I will, I mean, that is um, certainly a driving consideration for me in this. I will add that, that the fair funding formula, if that becomes an avenue to rectify the situation, is a formula that would benefit Haverford Township as well. Mm -hmm. um, that formula looks at growth in student enrollment and in students' educational needs. And because of our growing enrollment primarily, we would stand to see more funding from the state um, as part of that reconciliation. Um, two different reasons for um, supporting this, but um, I think both valid in, in the argument for um, Pennsylvania to more appropriately fund public education. And currently we are funded, I think, by the state's 18%? 18%. If we take. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to thank, um, thank you, Mr. Feinberg, for bringing this in front of the board because I think that a lot of folks just don't, um, don't realize the way that our public schools are funded. And um, because of the state's outdated system um, in which they know that the, the money should go through the fair funding formula, which has been created, which has been shown to be um, more fair to the districts, they do not funnel all of the money that goes to schools through that funding formula. And so um, it is, they're instead using an outdated formula that, that used to work that is based on old numbers, old data, and is not based on the current enrollment of students, the current need of students in schools. So it results in some schools that don't need the money getting more money than they need from the state and schools that do need the money to just educate their students not getting enough. And so um, if we in Haverford Township can raise our voices and, and give um, you know, really a platform to let folks know that this, un that this type of unfair funding is currently happening, but there is a way that the state knows um, what to do to, to make it more fair. Um, you know, I'm happy to have Haverford um, re really promote this effort. So thank you for bringing it. Can I, I give you a statistic? I just finished teaching a public finance class and one of my students uh, just wrote a paper about education funding. Um, St. Joe's is on our campus is half in Lower Marion and half in Philadelphia. So he did a case study of these two um, school districts. Um, funding for Philadelphia public schools is about $16,000 per student funding. And this is, I think this past academic year um, funding in Lower Marion is $33,000, so more than twice as much per student. 
Um, and these are communities that are literally right next to each other, right? Um, so, you know, I, I knew that because I know a lot about education funding from being on the school board, but, um, you know, as he was kind of working through this, this was like a real revelation for him that, and everyone in the class, he did a presentation and students were really shocked because I don't think they realized how inequitable the funding distribution is um, in our state. So um, it, it's, it's bad, um, so it's time, yeah, thanks. Any other discussion? All right, we will look forward to this coming back for a board vote to, to make it a formal resolution. Great, thank you. Item 12 is public comment and we did have someone sign up. The board values public comment as an essential component of school governance that adds information for the deliberation of the important and complex matters that come before the board. It is an opportunity for members of the community to address the board. It is not a question and answer period. While we conduct our business in open public meetings according to the Sunshine Act, it is not a meeting with the public. Our public comment is divided into two sections. This section um, is for comments on school related topics that are not on tonight's agenda. Residents of the township may in advance of the meeting sign up to make public comment by emailing public comment at haverfordsd.net and for our board policy, you will have three minutes to address the board. At the three minute point, a timer will sound and you will be asked to conclude your remarks. Please begin your comments by stating your name and confirming your residency in Haverford Township. If you have any materials to distribute, please leave them on the end of the board table. Your name and the topic of your comments will be recorded in the meeting minutes. And the person who signed up tonight is Alexis Pasternak. Hi, thank you. Uh, Alexis Pasternak, Habertown. Good evening, board and Dr. Rishi. The Handmaid's Tale is a classic novel found in many high schools across the country, including Haverford High School. I've read the book. I've read the book myself. It's been a long time, but the subject matter is heavy. But overall, I, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I think in the right context, the right setting, it's appropriate. What I'm here to speak about is the graphic novel version available in the high school library. Uh, I did provide you with some photocopies. I did take it out of the public library myself. Um, of course, context is important, and I would encourage you to read the book in its entirety yourselves. What you will see are images of rape, hanging, suicide ideation, groping, a less than positive visit to the OBGYN, my personal favorite, a naked woman on a leash eating out of a bowl, and a woman with a gun sticking in her mouth. In her mouth. This is disgusting. I wasn't gonna get upset, it's disgusting. I'm gonna quote Ramona Bessinger, a 23 year, um, teacher in Providence School District. She teaches English. She says, the written word is supposed to stimulate the reader to visualize and imagine the characters, places, and events about which the author writes. What this version has done is replaced the hard work of reading literature with a dumbed down, semi-pornographic comic book. And really, it is just feeding students someone else's interpretation. This book is nothing more than a knockoff taking up space on our school shelves at our expense, our expense. And why? Because it's lauded by the American Library Association, the library journal, school library journal as well. Having a book like this in the high school is a choice. It's a choice. You don't have to have this book here, okay? It's not a requirement. There's nothing wrong with saying no. There's nothing wrong with it. It does not mean you are for censorship or for banning books, Mr. Feinberg. It's not. It's about appropriateness. I care about our kids. I went to school here. My son goes here. I want him to stay here. I want to stay here. But this, this creeps me out. This is icky. 
I will go through the proper channels to have this book evaluated further. I'm sure it will not be removed because I'll be considered against diversity, equity, inclusion, and all that crap. I think some of you needed to get down in the weeds and see what is actually available to the students. And then ask yourself if literature like this is part of the hill you want to die on in the name of education. Please think about what you're doing. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is for a report on executive session. We did not meet in executive session. The board did meet for an informational. Board report. Oh, I'm sorry. I did. I skipped board reports. Um, it was at the bottom of my page. I'll start with uh, Mr. Schwartz. No report. No. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be quick. <laughs> All right. So um, on Sunday, Chestnut Wall is having their Chestnut Wall Chase. Um, it's adding to one of the many amazing fundraisers that the PTO sponsors there. Uh, the goal is to get a new swing set for the schools, and so swings are great. Um, it's useful for children of all ages um, and all abilities, and so I am cheering them on. They are able to reach their goal and be able to get a new swing set um, at Chestnut World. Discover Day is back, everyone. It was awesome. I took my kindergartner. She had an amazing time. She, Bugman, wow, Bugman. She touched all different kinds of bugs. She was very brave. She was like the first one with her hand in the air to volunteer. Um, I, I don't know exactly how many classrooms, but I would say at least 20 classrooms probably had different activities in them, all different activities. So many high school students volunteered, teachers volunteered. Um, tons of kids going through the halls, lots of activities that you could take home to make later. Um, just a really fantastic day. I'm so glad it's back. It's so fun. Um, so thanks to everybody that was involved with that. Thanks to the high schoolers who helped with all the little ones who were there. Um, it was a really great day. I'm so glad. Um, and it's coming back again in November at its usual time. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, and tomorrow, Linwood is May Day. Um, thanks for bringing the Linwood kids. They were great. Um, Tomorrow's May Day at Linwood, so um, we will be there mostly because I think the, the soft serve ice cream truck will be there, which is <laughs> going to be very <laughs> exciting. Um, but yeah, excited to go and, uh, and celebrate a, a pretty fantastic school year. So thank you. I'll start down on the other end with Dr. Uh, Dr. Larson. <laughs> Dr. So and so. Um, <laughs> so I attended the, the DCIU um, board committee meeting on Wednesday, May 11th. Um, DCIU committee meetings are um, very rich discussions because they wrap education, facilities, personnel, policy, everything you can imagine. Excuse me, Kristen, could you lean into the mic a little better? Because I'm going to be 70 soon and I can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Is that better? Okay. Um, so at this board committee meeting for DCIU last Wednesday, um, we discussed the, the project, the construction planning um, for the Delaware County Technical High School at Fullcroft. Um, right now the board is looking at different approaches to, um, to procurement for this project. We're leaning toward a hybrid approach because that would allow um, us to get, um, to look at a variety of methods that allow us to get the best value for DCIU um, as we're working on that construction project. Um, in terms of financing that project, um, we also reviewed different finance, financing objects, but um, sorry, options, but those are in flux because of interest rates. Um, so again, these are ongoing discussions. We're hoping to have some of this um, nailed down a little bit later in the summer. Um, DCIU is also working on an HVAC update project. They're looking at all their sites, um, Aston Fullcroft, uh, Marple, and Morton, um, with a range of different needs. So hopefully those will be addressed. Um, the personnel committee um, reported out that the staff vaccination rate is um, is great. I mean, the majority now of IU employees and CTE employees are fully vaccinated. They do have a mandate there that employees be vaccinated. Um, so that's great news. Um, we're also doing policy work, um, just like we do here in Haverford. Um, the policy that is currently in front of the board is the acceptable use of internet, computers, and network resources. They're taking um, a whole slew of technology related policies and rolling them into one and making sure they're updated with current um, PSBA recommendations and in line with um, you know, what council requires. Um, also some great news, um, the DCIU IT repair shop, which came online earlier this year, 
They are looking to bring on nine student interns um, for a summer full-time summer internship that would pay $20 an hour. Um, I hope maybe we can have um, Haverford students take advantage of this. It's just so exciting to hear that, you know, students will be doing this work, getting that hands-on experience. So that's my report. Thank you. Um, I was just gonna say, it's been a little bit of a busy week at Linwood. We had the art show. I was um, lucky enough to be able to chaperone the second grade field trip this week. And like Dr. Crispin mentioned, we have May Day at Linwood tomorrow. And so I will, be there at the raffle table, the candy, we, the wheel of candy, and at the entrance table for a little bit. Um, and I would, if I could just make a plug, it startled me, and I guess I forget because I have older boys um, who are out of Linwood, but with my younger son, so many people, um, and I'm sure that other elementary schools are seeing the same thing. There's these time honored events and traditions at all of our elementary schools. And since they've been gone for two years with the pandemic, a lot of people have no idea what they are. And I know we've struggled to get some volunteers for May Day. So um, please volunteer with your PTO and keep your at your elementary school, no matter which one it is. There's wonderful traditions that make each of our schools unique. Um, and it's ex exciting for the children to have them back. I know it's the first one. I couldn't believe it when he said he's never been to, I mean, he's been to May Day with his older brothers, but, um, uh, so to please help out your PTOs and volunteer for whatever your school has. Um, but we're excited to have it tomorrow. Thank you. No report. All right, Mr. Feinberg. State legislature has been in recess uh, due to the primary election. Uh, both the House and the Senate uh, are due back uh, on the 23rd. Um, significantly, for the first time in 30 years, the Pennsylvania House of Representatives uh, did pass the voucher bill. It's House Bill 2169. Uh, uh, it was a close vote, and that will be uh, moving on to the Senate. Uh, uh, I'm sure that the governor would veto it if it passed in the Senate, uh, but uh, we're following that one closely, and we'll keep you up to date. All right, thank you. Um, since the last board meeting, I've attended a couple of PSBA and, and local functions. Um, at the PSBA monthly leadership Zoom, they spoke about Pennsylvania. Um, the Pennsylvania School Boards Association has withdrawn from the National School Boards Association, and it, with 22 states or 22 states in total, um, have formed a new consortium of state school board associations that is in the works. Um, and Pennsylvania is looking once again to have uh, that as a new association of states that will provide um, governance and uh, training, best practices, have conventions and activities to support and advocate for public education. So we can, um, sounds like they've made a lot of progress already on, on forming that new COSBA group. Um, and we should look forward to hearing about its more formal um, kind of a, like leadership coming together and, and the governance structure that it sets up um, and then start looking for some activities that uh, Pennsylvania school districts could participate in. Um, there was also a meeting of the Delaware, uh, Delaware County Legislative Council and um, one of the things that's happening tomorrow, I think several of us and Dr. Rushi are going to the legislative breakfast, um, again, to be held in person for the first time in a couple of years. So like a breakfast with like a served breakfast. Um, <laughs> and it will feature uh, the discussion on mental health in schools um, and we'll have uh, representatives from state government, um, some local uh, districts who are talking about um, things happening in their districts with mental health programs. Um, and Mr. Feinberg's gonna be talking about charter reform. Um, so it should be a good event and an opportunity for the districts to uh, connect with our local legislature to tell them some of the challenges that we're dealing with um, and you know, hear about some of the ideas that hopefully will be helping schools. Um, and then there was another meeting of the PSBA school directors um, and it featured their 2022 state of education report um, that is uh, based on surveys of districts across Pennsylvania as well as PDE and um, US Department of Education funding or um, 
surveys and, and data um, and looking at some of the trends affecting schools. A lot of it is probably not a surprise at this point in the pandemic that there are challenges with staffing shortages and um, inadequate and changing guidance from <laughs> from um, the, like the health departments and, and CDC on managing COVID um, and you know, challenges around budgets and, and um, the pension crisis is one that got a particular note of um, the amount of funding that we are required to contribute to the, um, the pensions that need to come from our budgets each year. So um, lots of lots of topics that are being battled, not just here in our district, but across the state. And so it's always good to get those updates. Um, and uh, I also was just going to say that um, I am looking forward to some of these end of year activities. I think next week um, I have a chance to go to two activities at the high school, um, the Parade of Champions. I also had been going to some track meets and saw some of the performances that Mia, you talked about. I saw Aubrey's um, record setting hurdles and I saw some super fast miles and great teamwork <laughs> on relays. Um, lots of fun to go and cheer on the Fords in whatever venue. Um, and there's also a, um, a kind of a game of life that's gonna happen to teach some real life budgeting skills. And I hope to help out at that one next week too. And I think I and, and the rest of the board will have some opportunities at some of these year end celebrations for the elementary schools. Um, we'll look forward to getting those on the calendar and then we'll all be looking forward to graduation not that far away. Um, so with that, now I can say that um, my report on the executive session was that we did not have an executive session, but the board did meet for an information session to learn more about our food services program. Uh, the next regular public board meeting will be on uh, June 2nd, 2022 at 7.30 in the Haverford Middle School. We're going to once again move <laughs> move locations. You gotta keep up with where we'll be. Um, that is because we will be honoring our retirees and have a bigger group that night. Um, as noted earlier in the meeting, before the next regular public board meeting, we are going to host a special board meeting um, with the vote on the change to the health and safety plan. And that will be Tuesday, May 24th at 6.30 here in this room. And with that, I welcome a motion to adjourn. Second. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.